going to read from the second epistle of the Apostle Paul to Timothy, his disciple, chapter 1. And I'll read from verse 9 to 12, just four verses from 2 Timothy 1, 9 to 12. Later, at home, you should read the whole epistle and perhaps the whole chapter carefully, but now we are going to read. I'll read, and I ask you to follow while I read 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 to 12. Thus says the sacred text. God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and his own grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet, I'm not ashamed. Because I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, Dear Lord, give us illumination now, we pray. Nourish our souls. Give us the manna from heaven that we need. And give us your blessing to our inner beings. Enlighten our minds, we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, I will be starting a new series of messages on the second epistle of the Apostle Paul to his disciple Timothy, who was a pastor in Corinth and also other churches in the first century of the Common Era. I will preach around one sermon on each of the four chapters of the book. Second Timothy is one of the so-called pastoral epistles. There are three of them among the four letters which Paul sent, only four, to individuals. And we find these four in the Bible. These individuals were three. Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. All three were disciples of Paul. This last one, Philemon, is a letter about the slave Onesimus, also a convert and a disciple of Paul. Just like Titus and Timothy, who were disciples and became pastors in the early church. There are 13 letters of Paul in the New Testament. Do you know what that means? It means that half of the 27 books of the New Testament have Paul as their author. Almost half. 13 of 
27. And the other 14 books were all written later than Paul's letters and were profoundly influenced by them. The whole New Testament exudes of Paul's ideas, which were given to him through divine inspiration. Not only the letters precede the four Gospels, which is important, not only they precede them chronologically, which is something that many do not realize, but also the order in which the letters are placed in the Bible, the order is not chronological at all. The first letters to be written were Galatians and first Thessalonians. The order that the Bible follows is based upon two principles. First is size, and the other is the other C's. So, first we have a group of nine letters written to churches, which is followed then by the four letters written to individuals. And then, Within those two groups of epistles, they are lined up according to size, from the biggest to the smallest. So that's the criteria in which they were placed in our New Testament. This short passage that I have selected from the first chapter of the second epistle of Paul to Timothy contains Paul's vibrant personal testimony, which is a confession that God saved him and called him to a holy life. Paul repeatedly says in his epistles that believers are called to a life of holiness. And holiness means being separated set apart to be of use by God. And how can we be of use to God? Well, first and foremost, by manifesting the presence of his Holy Spirit, being the temple of the Holy Spirit, his church. And here, as he gives this personal testimony, he makes it universal to all Christians and uses the plural to express the commonality of our redemption in Christ. God has saved us, not because of anything of merit that we have done, but because of his grace. This is what we have read because of his grace, which is what? The unmerited favor of God. Or, if you prefer, God's riches at Christ's expense. Not because we deserved it, but rather to further, according to Paul, to further his own purposes. God's own purposes purposes. His mercy and his grace were given us, Paul says, before the world began. God's grace was given us, the Bible says, in Christ since forever, from eternal ages ago, from eternity, because God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is the word of God. In fact, this is Paul's central theme in the epistle to the Romans, for instance, and the whole of the Pauline corpus, as we say. The grace of God was bestowed to us, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose 
and because of his own grace. Redemption was given us in Christ Jesus, the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past. Like Paul says also in Romans 16, verse 25. Grace is central to Paul's theology. Only through grace can we be united with Christ. This grace was given to us long before we were born. This hidden grace has now been revealed to humanity through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago. The world, uh, the, sorry, the word that we have here in this passage, the word appearing, is the Greek word epiphania. Epiphania, which has given us the English word epiphany. It denotes, it denotes, denotes a manifestation of sacred and divine things which are hidden. It normally refers to the second coming of Christ in Paul's letters. But here, here it obviously refers because of the text and the context. It refers to his first coming. Jesus Christ was an epiphany, a manifestation of that which was hidden, sacred, and divine. Paul goes on by saying that at his first coming, Christ destroyed death through his own death. On the cross. It reminds me of the famous Puritan writer John Owen, who said that in one of his writings has a title that is The Death of Death in the Death of Christ. Beautiful title. Like we read in the epistle to the Hebrews, which is not one of Paul's. And this is something that we had mistakenly thought so until the 18th century. But for the last uh, almost 300 years now, we realized that Hebrews it was not written by Paul. And now I quote from Hebrews chapter 2. Here I am and the children who God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too, Christ Jesus, shared in their humanity. So that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil. And free, the, and free those who are all, all their lives were held in slavery by their Fear of death. Hebrews 2, 13 to 15. Those who are saved and united to God in Christ have no fear of death whatsoever. I repeat, those who are saved and united to God in Christ have no fear of death whatsoever. Why? Because in Christ we have found life and immortality. This is what Paul says here in 2 Timothy. Immunity from spiritual and eternal death. And this is the gospel. This is the good news which was revealed in Christ. This is what was brought to light by Christ. For the proclamation of this gospel, Paul was appointed. And this is how he goes on. A herald and an apostle 
and a teacher. Paul repeated this threefold formula a few times. A herald, an apostle, a, pre uh, a teacher. Each one has a specific meaning. We do not have time now to delve into each one of them, but we'll examine the first one. Paul calls himself a herald. In Greek, the word is kerix. Kerix. It was used regularly in Paul's time to designate a messenger vested with public authority, a person who conveyed the messages of public officials or who gave a public summons. Well, in the New Testament, a kerix, a herald, signifies one who was given the task to announce a message which came from God. And the message, we call it in theological circles, is the kerigma, from the word keris, the kerigma, which is what we call the gospel, the good news that in Christ we have been forgiven and we have been reconciled to God by grace and through faith alone since forever. Paul heralded it. Paul preached it. And Paul taught it. And to me, as a minister of word and sacrament of the Reformed Church in America. There is no greater glory than follow in his steps and repeat the same announcement again and again and preach and teach the same divine message. This is it. This is the message. And it is indeed urgent. It is beautiful. It is lovely. And we need no other. And I have no other to give you. But the truth is that Paul's appointment by God the Father and by the Lord Jesus Christ as a herald and as a preacher as a teacher of the gospel had cost him much in suffering and also much, much persecution. So what? Of course, suffering is part of the life of the Christian, isn't it? As it was a formidable part of the life and ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is why Paul says elsewhere that we are all completing in our own bodies the suffering of Christ. He says, now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you. And I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. This is from Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. The King James is a little bit better here. It says, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you. And fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. For the sake of his body, which is the church. And this is how the passage can be read in the so-called Good News Translation. I am happy about my sufferings for you. I am happy about them. For by means of my physical sufferings, I am helping to complete what still remains of Christ's sufferings on behalf of the church, which is his body. Paul was suffering, but he says he was not ashamed. 
He was not vexed. He was not upset. He was not perplexed. He was not overwhelmed because he had a personal connection to Christ. Yes, he had a personal connection to Christ. He knew him. He did not have theoretical knowledge of Christ. This is not what Paul is saying here. He is saying that he is well acquainted with Christ. That he talks to him. That he listens to him. He knows the guy. He knows he is trustworthy. He knows this person in whom he believed. And he was persuaded that Jesus Christ was able to God all of God's riches and whatever was entrusted to him until the awesome day of the Lord. In other words, and to conclude, Paul was not afraid of death. He was not afraid of judgment day. And he was not afraid of the end of the world. He was confident that God would support him would preserve him and guard him and also his teaching and his apostolic work and his converts and his disciples, even if there should be death, even if the end times should come. It doesn't matter. May the Lord give us the same confidence, the same trust, the same certainty of God's mercy and of God's grace that the Apostle Paul had. So that we may follow his example. So that we may also be witnesses. So that we may also live fearlessly. So that we may also live in holiness. Spreading around us the good aroma of Christ, the evidence of our mystical and spiritual union with Christ. May God reach us out in his mercy and renew us today, each one of you and also myself. God bless you. Amen.